Hi, everyone. Um, this is going to be a talk about mo mostly a couple experiments that I did, some of which panned out and a lot of which didn't, and how I got there, which will hopefully be more interesting than the dry topics in the slides. Um, well, I mean, th it's fine. Um, so quick disclaimer. The talk is independent. I am employed by Google. I am not being paid to do this in any way. Um, and I am not, you know, this is not my day job. I don't work on anything related at work. Okay, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, so there's an outline of what I'm going to be doing, uh, just like talking about what makes compression on ZFS somewhat different in requirements than, you know, if you picked up a random thing off a library, rather. Uh, just uh, then trying to update LZ4 because people keep asking about that. Trying to update Z standard because people keep asking about that. Um, trying to add Brotly because I have had like three people ask about that. And then an experiment that did pan out more, uh, adding an early abort function to the Z standard compression. And then a summary. And if we have time, a bunch of random other experiments that I didn't go into depth. Um, now, why did I do this? Uh, it, you know, sometimes it was just spite, like somebody said, I don't think that'll work. Or I said to myself, I don't think that'll work, but I can't convince myself it won't. Let's try it. Um, you know, it, it's nice to have some of the results, like I'm going to show later, about going from two hours to 15 minutes on compressing something. Great. Um, People keep asking, and it's nice to have an answer besides, well, it's hard and we haven't tried. And more directly, I started contributing more actively because I spent a bunch of time on leave, and I wanted to get back into the habit of actually working. Um, so I started trying to reliably contribute a little bit, and the habit stuck. And now you're all stuck with me. Um, so. Unique requirements about compression here. Uh, so in a couple of places, ZFS assumes that if it decompresses and recompresses, it gets the same thing back. Um, the one I can recall offhand is uh, if you use the L2R persistence, it always saves it compressed. But if you have uncompressed arc, then you may be sad if there's a mismatch. Um, so swapping out just LZ4 or Z standard or whatever for a new version will produce different results. Both can decompress and compress each, and both can decompress each other, but like ZFS will get sad. And when ZFS is sad, it will throw errors. Um, this would also, for example, cause problems for like NOP write or dedupe, because you know, different result, different checksum. That time. Uh, technically right now that's a problem with using gzip, um, because Linux and everything else use different Zlib compression versions. Um, and also a problem if you use the Intel QAT offload stuff. Um, but nobody's really complained about it. It just is true. So maybe it's not really a problem we have to worry too much about. Or maybe nobody's using GZIP. Who knows? But more interestingly, like ZFS has like tiny records that we're compressing, right? Like 128K, 1 meg. If you really turn it up, 16. Um, and a lot of things are focused on like large streams of data or large masses of data at once. So for example, Z standards performance tests, as far as I can tell, are mostly focused on like either parallel streams or large like tens or hundreds of meg sets of data. Um, whereas we're never going to get that large or, well, I suppose if we get really creative, we could, but why? And ZFS won't save space in tiny units. So in order to save something compressed, currently, we require that both these be true. It saves at least one block on disk, and it saves at least 12.5% space. I have patches to play with it being attunable, but there are trade-offs involved, and I'm not going into that right now. Um, but so as a result, if you have a compression thing that goes from, oh, I, yeah, I did have it already. Well, uh, if you save like another 3K on 128K, it's not worth the trade-off, so it won't make a difference, even if 
you know, 3K of 128K across your whole data set is kind of long. So, you know, patching that to be controllable might be worthwhile for some people. And ZFS doesn't built in have notions about like, I'm running compression, you know, LZ4 version one, two, three, whatever. So each of the compression algorithms currently would get to implement handling that themselves, um, which is not impossible, like I have branches for this, but um, it is an additional complexity you have to deal with. So anytime you wanna update it, you would have to consider whether that complexity is worth it versus what you get. Um, and currently, as I alluded to earlier, Z standard, for example, does a bunch of things about parallelizing compression, and the interface for doing that gets slightly worse compression sometimes, but also is parallelizable. But that also means that it can be unreliable. How It doesn't necessarily guarantee you'll always get the same compressed result if you do that, is my understanding. So that would run into problems with caveat one. So here's how I did the graphs that are coming up here. Um, I made a couple data sets that I thought would be differently reflective. One of them is a 20 year old mail der I've got that's you know, text, so mostly highly compressible, but tinier files. A bunch of firmware blobs that I have from updating various devices over the last decade, which mostly incompressible, not entirely, but mostly. And then a bunch of public text files off archive.org because I wanted something that would be large-ish and really, really compressible. Um, and then a snapshot of my root file system because that's just a wild card of all sorts of things. Um, then wrote them at different record sizes, made send streams, fed them into receives, backed by fast storage a couple times and averaged the results. Um, the space savings can be kind of variable because you're also weighing how much the metadata, among other things, compresses, and that's going to vary based on where it puts things, or you know, phase of the moon, or whatever. There's variation that's going to happen naturally, even if you didn't do something differently. So if you see results below like 30 megs or something, it is probably just noise. And I did this with a my Zen 3 desktop my Intel Coffee Lake desktop, my Raspberry Pis, and a Mac Mini, which seems like a reasonable set. I would have also done like a Spark, but I tried letting that run for 12 hours and it still wasn't done, so I, I said no. <laughs> Much as I enjoy running things on Spark. Uh, but, you know, surprising nobody, things that are one CPU intensive task, essentially, a lot, are going to vary wildly. The graphs in this are like all cherry picked. I have enormous collections of them if anyone wants to look, but like these are all cherry picked to be interesting results. So, you know, this is not exhaustive. So LZ4 originally, the code that we have in there now was about from December 2012. There was a lot of spelunking involved to find that. Um, I was trying to figure out a good way to add compatibility because, or backward compatibility without a feature change because it seems like a shame since they're forward and backward compatible. Um, and Z standard does this by putting a header at the front with versioning information, but that would break old LZ4. So the thing I did was, sorry? Oh, I, I can't, I'm apparently hearing things, great. Uh, you can stick a version field on the end in the gap between how long LZ4 thinks the record is and how long it actually is. And I checked, and the old code is perfectly happy with this, doesn't care, great, and you can handle all the rest however you like. It's very tiny, like LZ4 is like LZ4.c and LZ4.h, and also LZ4hc.c and h, basically. Like, it, it's tiny, really easy to just log in and go have a nice day. Um, so I tried this on the mailder and the firmware blobs, and the space delta I got, even at a one meg record size, was like, you know, 15 megs one way, five megs another way, like nothing. Like it's noise. Um, so I tried again to see how long it would take to write and read and the mailder. 
And you know, writing was noise. Like there was no difference really. But reading, on the other hand, like the newer decompressor, that you know, that that's a pretty good delta, and like the range on it was pretty large across a bunch of different data sets. Um, like sometimes it was a little faster, sometimes it was a lot faster, but it wasn't really ever slower. So that error wasn't supposed to show up that way. Oh well. Uh, after all that. The compressor wasn't really worth it, and the complexity wasn't really worth it. Um, but the decompressor was a good win, so why don't we just take that and go boom? Um, and I did, and it landed uh, after not very much review because it was like, mm, it, it works, and we can always just pull it out if it doesn't work. And it's not in a stable release right now, but I've been running it since before it got merged, and I haven't found anything that breaks. Um, so it'll be in the next release. Great. Um, the standard update is the one that a lot of people have been agitating about wanting. The one we're running was released in May 2020, merged in August 2020, I believe. Um, it's not when the PR was open, just when that version was merged. A bunch of different files um, kind of involved. So originally it was all aggregated into one file because the standard has a thing to do that for you. Already built in versioning, so like no fun on disk format meddling to deal with. One unfortunate thing is that their testing was such that 1.5.0 was so much faster, they decided to turn up the compression settings for each of the levels in 1.5.1 and newer. So as a result, those all are slower than they were because they figured they had performance bandwidth to burn. Um, this is not my favorite way of measuring this, but I didn't get a better one working. Um, so, okay, you know, you save like 10 or, you know, like tens of megs essentially. Um, I'm sorry that the graph doesn't have nice units, but it doesn't like rendering negative numbers. Um, that's a bunch of different versions that I bolted on in addition to 145 and the difference from that to 145. So, you know, Z standard 5 is a nice improvement. 7 and 11 are okay improvements and you know, the rest is noise. Is how I would interpret that. Your mileage may vary. Um, but then on a different data set or the same data set actually if I recall with a different record size, then the space usage goes up or does nothing. And the amount of time it takes to write goes substantially up um, with the previous one. That is so you know, going from sorry, again I'm hearing things great. Uh, you know, going up by like 30 seconds out of 120 or so, not really a great result. Um, and if you look, you can see that's with 151 and newer that it gets substantially larger. And it still gets substantially larger, or a little larger for 1.5.0. Um, oh, I didn't mention the S suffix is when I turned on allowing it to use like inline assembly, um, which requires more expensive things in the kernel, which is why I did it differently. Um, then this result, which was the incompressible data being really, really slow, it's like, oh, no, this is a bad idea. Um, so after all that, it would complicate that to have like something to handle the standard versioning properties because I'd argue for that because otherwise, you know, people with dedupe and not write would be very sad indeed. Um, but then we'd need to keep it around forever and yeah. Um, sometimes markedly slower for no better results. The early abort thing that I mentioned earlier and I'm going to talk about shortly might be very helpful for this. Um, I thought I had something set up with that integrated already, but I didn't. Um, and I ran out of time because I discovered I had done half of these tests wrong um, when I was rerunning them with updates. I had half integrated the old version and half the new one, and that, that, that wasn't going to do anything useful. So I fixed that but did not have time to rerun this. So I'm probably going to do that during the hackathon tomorrow unless I have a better project. And we'll see how that goes. Um, all the graphs are after fixing that, to be clear. 
the previous graphs were much worse results and always said never do this, as opposed to sometimes. So the other thing, another thing I tried was adding broadly because like a couple people came to me and said, hey, here, have you heard of this compression thing? I was like, I've heard of it. I've not heard that many people use it that often, but I've heard of it. Um, and, you know, it was already in like self-contained C, great. Not like uh, another experiment I did, which was trying Snappy, but Snappy is written in um, Go. So not as convenient. Um, sure, let, let's go. Pun not intended. Broadly compression goes like 0 to 9. And so, you know, that's a fairly simple range. There's not anything complicated. Technically, it says 10 and 11 too, but those are a very different thing and should not ever be used interactively. Do not do it. It's bad. It's bad. Don't do it. Um, it turned out to be a little more complicated because it turns out Brotley wants to do floating point math when it compresses. And running floating point math in the kernel can be sad. They, I asked on the mailing list. They were considering adding fixed point, but they haven't done it. Um, so, you know, we get to do that. We put barriers around every call in. And then it turns out the allocator has a problem where when it says no sleep, it actually means no sleep unless I want to. Um, and sleeping when you have preemption disabled is bad. Don't do that. Linux gets really mad. Though oddly it doesn't mind on older x86 kernels for some reason, but newer ones or any other platform, it gets real mad. Uh, so I wrapped it with something that pre-allocates the memory for you so it can't really ever run out of memory, but then you're dealing with memory overheads. But So that was a fun discovery of a bug that like we had never run into before, but was there for, you know, ever. Um, this is a bunch of useful, or a bunch of comparisons of uh, Z-standard, Gzip, Brotly, LZ4, and nothing. Uh, Brotly is red, and Z standard fast is light blue, and Z standard is dark blue. Um, all of that is mostly to be referenced later, but the point I wanted to make is that it looks like Brotly at lower levels can be better and faster than the other options that you might have. Like, you can see, can you see my cursor right here? Yes. So you can see here that like Brotly at its lowest level is nicer than say Gzip or Z standard one, while also being you know, pretty fast compared to them. So you know, not I don't I don't think that it's worth the difference, especially with the complications and overhead that I had to do to get it working. Um, you know, if somebody comes up with a good use case or says this works much better for my data. And, you know, maybe, but, you know, put it on the shelf and come back if there's ever a good use case. Great. Um, what am I doing on time? Cool. Uh, so early abort uh, was a feature that I thought maybe this could work. Um, because one thing we talk about a lot or there was a lot of talk about, you could find in lots of blogs and people talking, is that one of the reasons LZ4 is nice on ZFS is that it will bail out early rather than wasting time trying to compress things. And, you know, Z standard is another compression thing originally by the same author. Um, so surely it would do something similar or have some similar functionality. Are we maybe not using it? Because I'm sure if you've used the higher Z standard levels, you are familiar with how unfortunate it can make your system. <laughs> If you don't, if you're not careful, um, and if it doesn't work, can we make them glued together? <laughs> so, the explanation of what LZ4 does right now, basically, is that if it gets like n bytes into the into a chunk that it's trying to compress and it hasn't compressed any of it, it will just go, I'm out, and hop to the next chunk rather than trying on the rest. Um, so it skips through small portions at a time, so you still get decent compression even if it's a mix of compressible and incompressible data without burning all your CPU time on things you can't compress. 
That's my understanding from reading the code carefully. I did not go ask the author. So if I find out I'm wrong, I'll tell people, but that's my understanding. So originally, I tried this. I looked at trying to like get this directly into the Z standard code, but that would require modifying the basically vanilla Z standard code we have baked in. And changing the actual output of the compression call would violate the original constraint I mentioned of like compression, decompression, compression, not being different. Because if it you know, incrementally goes through and changes what 4K in the middle of a 128K record compresses like, then it's going to be a different output and you're set. So as an initial experiment, thinking I'd do something more refined after this maybe worked, I tried gluing LZ4 on as like a pass filter for whether to decide it should compress or not was the standard. And the initial results look really confusingly good. That is a nonlinear graph on the left because otherwise it's just not readable because it just um, So a notable thing here with the incompressible data is like on my, this was on my Ryzen. Uh, on there, it took 10 minutes to write the incompressible blobs at one meg record size without this change. And with this change, it took about a minute and a half. So, you know, kind of a difference. Um, and the amount of space used difference was like, you know, like 100 megs or 10 megs or something really small. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll take you know, a fifth of the time for 10 megs out of 45 gigs or, um, you know, great. Except if I try this on highly compressible data, then the delta gets a lot bigger. <laughs> and it was like two gigs or so, um, if I recall. So, like, it didn't take much longer, so that's fine. But the delta was like losing two gigs of compression, and that, that's not really okay. Um, Okay, so like that first result was really good. There's no way I'm ignoring this after that. But we can't really say, oh, I'm sorry, you might lose, you know, like 2.5% compression on this. That's not really an okay result. What if we use Z standard as a pass to decide whether to use the higher compression instead? Um, if you look on the right, it's uncompressed. On the far left, it's just using Z standard 3. And in the middle, it's using different Z standard and LZ4 levels, or Z standard levels and LZ4, rather, to as a pass for whether to try the compression. Yeah, me too. But um, so it turns out that all of them are really bad as um, a first pass compared to just using LZ4. Um, in terms of space savings, like they're all, they all give up worse. And I don't show it here, but the amount of time they take is also sometimes worse the, high, the closer it gets to LZ4 because LZ4 is really the king of what it does. It, it's really astonishingly good at it. Um, but what if we try doing both? There's no way like running two compression passes first is going to be time or space efficient, right? <laughs> Right? <laughs> um, and yet, um, if you look on the far left, you can see using LZ4 and then a Z standard level is more space effective than just using LZ4, which is right here, you know, up to like using Z standard 2, where the delta between it and just running Z standard 3 is tiny. So how much time does that take? Let's run that test again, where we do the incompressible blobs, and you know it looks basically the same. Um, I think I didn't run it quite as far out because I didn't feel like waiting for Z standard 18 to run. Um, so okay, that that's still good savings, great. And on the highly compressible stuff, you can see the delta is like nothing. <laughs> it's like oh. Um, and the time difference as well, in addition to the space difference, is still you know, pretty negligible. Um, it's actually, until you get up to like Z standard 15, still basically the same. Um, 
which is pretty good for you know taking some of the data and trying two different compressors first before you try the thing you were going to do. Okay, so this was all run on like my high-end Ryzen. I've got a lot of cores and computation per core. There's no way this should work on a Raspberry Pi. Actually, funny story. Um, it goes, if you do the same incompressible, incompressible data test from taking, you know, well over, uh, oh, I'm sorry, um, I, you know, it goes from taking 6,000 seconds to, you know, like eight, 900 seconds to write this. So about, I, I said two hours here, but I'm thinking, yeah, that math is okay. I did check that. Two hours to like 13 minutes, and the space delta is like nothing. Okay, you know, like I'll take that. I will absolutely take not taking two hours to write this at that compression level. That's great. So I skipped over playing with different record sizes and trade offs to not to decide when to do this because ultimately I picked at least a standard three and at least 128K. Um, I also skipped over finding out that there was a bug in how the arc did recompression that never came up unless you ran this. I still don't understand why it never came up unless you ran this, but it sure did. So that got fixed. Um, as I alluded to, I have a lot of graphs. And I can't just push this up to Z standard because um, you know, they don't only operate in tiny chunks like this. They operate on like streams of data or lots of things in parallel, neither of which is conducive to something that blocks like this. Um, so I opened a PR, and it landed about two months later. It's not in 2.1. It'll be in the next release. Um, there's a backport, but like that, that's a very kind of, the actual amount of code change is not that large, but you know, it's kind of a significant change in what you might expect it to do. So it's not in a point release, uh, is my understanding. I obviously am not in charge of them. But you know, if you want to play with it, have a nice day and let me know if you find something it's pathological on, because I haven't yet. So, okay, we only lose like, 60 megs or so, that's great, but what if we could do better? So funny story, it turns out Brotly at low levels is even better than using both passes at this, even though you have to do the FPU instruction guard around it. Um, I'm not suggesting, oh, that's not coming up gradually. I thought I did that. Oh, well. Um, but I'm not suggesting we merge it for that reason, right? Like that's, that's too much work for too little, but it's a really fun data point and really strange. Um, and you know, that I thought would be somewhat entertaining to people who find this sort of thing funny. Um, laughing at compression is not necessarily what you were expecting, but here we are. Uh, so here's a summary. Um, Right, so LZ4 update, the decompressor was a nice win. The compressor not really, like you could make an argument about better security for the same sort of compression level, but like then you have to deal with a lot of complexity. And, uh, if you ever decide you want to do it, let me know. I have a branch, it works, it's great. Uh, but that would be my opinion. Z standard update seemed like a bad idea. I realized halfway through testing I did it wrong and did not have enough time to wire it up properly to run all the tests again before this. My apologies. Um, but so far it looks like it could maybe be a win because it turns out, as we learned with early abort, a lot of the time you're spending is mostly on things you can't compress. So if you can skip those in some way, it's a big win. Um, you know, Bratley was fun, but like, you know, it, it's a compression algorithm. It, it, it doesn't magically, you know, I don't know, use neural networks to magically recreate your data in five bytes. Like, it, early abort, 
Again, I will swear this, does, this should not work, but I cannot argue that as far as I can tell, it definitely does. So it's been merged, and everyone can benefit from it and use higher levels of compression on their backup devices and tiny things that don't have much CPU without losing lots of space. And I didn't actually remember to mention this, but the reason you can get away with that is because it's deciding whether to compress or not whole records, not changing what the records are like inside them. So because of that, you don't run into the problems with like compatibility because, OK, it's uncompressed. Great, it's the same thing. Or it's compressed, and it's the same thing. Um, how much time do I have? Great. Um, that's fine. I included a bunch of experiments that I didn't go into nearly as much depth in the slides in, in case I had a lot of time. Um, so I tried updating Zlib because you know, integrating our own Zlib copy would avoid the problems I mentioned earlier with different gzip versions that nobody really runs into but are still there. We just don't hit them in practice. But a lot of the ones that are faster than just baseline gzip, or zlib, I should be consistent, um, mostly rely on doing FPU instructions to be better, and don't actually seem to be consistently better, and are often significantly worse at compressing in the limited testing that I did. Um, and some of them are really hard to get to compile in the kernel because they are not remotely similar styles of code, because they reshuffled everything. Um, as I mentioned, I found while doing this, Linux actually did a similar thing to what I did with the LZ4 decompressor and merged the Zlib decompressor that was newer, like 15, 20 years ago, but left the compressor because it had this tiny regression on ARM and nobody ever cared again. <laughs> Surprise. Um, and, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter because I haven't heard lots of people using Gzip, right? Like, LZ4 is better at one thing, Z standard is better at another. Um, so you would really only use it if you were trying to have some compatibility with things that don't understand either of those. And that would be a very niche set of people. As I mentioned, oh, Snappy was, oh, I remember what I was thinking of. It's S2, which was written in Go. Uh, Snappy is written in C++, which, you know, lobbing that into the kernel, not, not fun. Don't do that. But one of the Linux kernel devs wrote a C implementation to consider something similar a few years ago, so I could just use that. My experience was that it's bad at general use. Um, since as far as I understand, it was really intended to, like, my understanding is it was basically intended to compress, like, blocks of text. That, that was the goal. You know, like a tiny thing to compress text, have a nice day. Um, so it's not too surprising that throwing general results or general sets of data at it did not end well. Um, S2 is an interesting project where a, um, if I understand correctly, a database developer decided to integrate Snappy, decided it didn't perform well enough, and wrote their own re-implementation of it that is backwards compatible compression and decompression, but markedly faster and better, which is a neat trick. But the, their implementation is written in Go, so I'm not lobbing that into the kernel. I, I know. Um, and I haven't spent time trying to re-implement it. But it's an interesting thing if anyone wants to consider it. And I tried playing with the Z standard memory allocator, because as anyone who's looked at the code knows, it does its own custom pooling allocation thing. Um, which works, but you know it's a weird custom thing. It would be nice if we didn't have to have this custom thing over here when we have all these other things. But Linux, at least, has limits on its own like caching allocator things in terms of how large the thing you can cache is. Um, it will just complain if you try to make like a 32 meg allocation or something. Um, so you can't build a pooling thing out of that because it won't do it, and you know, just dynamically allocating on demand the size of the allocation that this thing needs sometimes is just sad. So I tried using the ZIO allocators after um, seeing a patch that Alan made at one point to do that. And it seemed slightly faster, like cold, 
but then the more you ran it, it basically became noise compared to the other allocator. So I, I don't really think that's worth trying to merge if it's going to not be better the longer you let it run. Um, I was going to say that I believe it's the last slide, so now I'm happy to talk about anything I just said or lots of other random experiments I've done that I didn't <laughs> um, because I thought well, when I practiced this, I was better at talking slower. <laughs> Questions from anyone? If not, I'll go away. That's fine. But <laughs> yes, there are, and that's as I mentioned and didn't actually talk a lot about. I think in the slide. Um, that's something that Brotley does, and that's the thing it does that needs floating point math, is it does at higher levels anyway. Uh, an entropy estimation calculation on the block you hand it, but that's, that can be expensive. I think LZ4 mostly doesn't do that. Z standard does at higher levels. Um, doing that fast is kind of a problem though, right? Like you, you can basically do, my understanding, I am not an expert in this field, is that you, it basically runs into a bit counting problem, is what you want to do, or something to that effect. Um, so modern CPUs do have fast instructions for that. So someone could probably write one to use for this purpose. That's a better refinement than just the brute force of running multiple compressors. Great. But aside from that, I don't know how fast you could be at it other than having to iterate over the whole thing or having data on it initially, um, like having data on what your input is before you came in, is my understanding. Um, yes? Uh, you mentioned like with LZ4 when you were looking at it, kind of hacking it and using training end of it or versioning. Yeah. Is that, like for Broadly, for example, is that a half to employ there for you, or is it just no, I, I mean, I could. It would work fine as far as I know. I didn't try that. I just put it at the front. But the reason I did that with LZ4 is because we had the existing implementation that does have a header on the front, and that header is not that large. Um, it has, the, I believe, the compressed size of the data at the front, and that's it. Um, so I couldn't just shove it in there because there was already something there, and I, I wanted to maintain the backward compatibility um, as much as I could because it seems like a shame to have a feature flag bump that out for no reason. Um, so I could do that, but it's not necessary there because there's no existing Brotley implementation I have to care about. Um, no, I'm just throwing it out. Um, and that wouldn't necessarily work because the way that it works is that it operates on tinier chunks than the whole thing I hand it. So I don't remember the constants I'll hand, but you know, like it, if it gets like 16, it gets like 12K into 16K and it's not done it, it just will skip to the next 16K. So you still get some compression even if it, and then the, and all of the algorithms we have integrated, we hand them a smaller buffer based on the, 12.5% I mentioned earlier. And if they run out of space, they give up rather than overrunning the buffer because that would be bad. Um, and so, no, it's just running over the whole thing or 87.5% of it potentially, depending. Um, I'm not using any dry run flags. I did experiment with using the higher levels of LZ4, which we don't expose, but like all the codes there. Um, but it turned out turning the level up at all just made LZ4 markedly slower and did not significantly improve the results. Um, so. All right. Yeah, we have a break until 3.10. How, what time is it now? I did talk fast.